So I'm going to talk about uh, what I've been doing. So we, we've been developing energy plans to transition states and countries to 100% clean renewable energy. And by clean and renewable, that's wind and water and solar power. It does not mean biofuels. It does not mean nuclear power. It does not mean natural gas mm -hmm. or coal with carbon capture. It's, it's simply clean and renewable energy because we're trying to address air pollution and climate and energy security simultaneously. And the only way you can do all of these together is by eliminating sources of combustion altogether and electrifying everything. And so this is the idea is to electrify the world to all purposes. So all purposes means electricity, transportation, heating and cooling industry, agriculture, forestry, fishing. And so we've De developed plans uh, not only for the 50 United States now, but just recently for 139 countries of the world, and those were built starting last week. And I'll tell you a little bit about them. Um, the other thing that was released was a. We also realized that well, the grid has to be stable. With a, if you have intermittent wind and solar, in a in a large portion, of it. but it turns out that when you actually electrify everything, it actually makes it easier to stabilize the grid because you have more what are called flexible loads. So like transportation, you know, you don't have to you don't have to wire a wind turbine to your car to drive it around because they have batteries inside. So you can actually power, you know, provide the power to a car different times of the day. So you can control when the car gets power. You've got a, and the utility can give incentives for people to charge, for example, at night. And this, this is called what's called, called a flexible load. It makes, the, makes it, uh, as opposed to inflexible loads, like you, like you need, like when you turn the lights on, you need that electricity right away. Uh, but uh, for some, there are a lot of loads you can the grid, especially heating and cooling, and transportation, and so an indus in an industry as well, where you can control when people get their power. It turns out it makes it a lot easier to match power demand. So we just did a study um, based on our, after doing the 50 state plans where we, we looked at transitioning each of the 50 states to 100% wind, water, and solar. We did a grid integration study. Could we keep the grid stable with those 100% plans? And we found is, yeah, without any loss of load over a six year period, every 30 seconds we found over the United States, we could keep the entire grid stable. So that's the number one criticism that uh, people who are, have been against wind and solar and other intermittent <coughs> renewable energy sources have said that you just can't keep the lights on, it's going to be way expensive, you need all this peaking power, you need gas to, for providing peaking, but it turns out you don't. You do not need natural gas at all for peaking power, let alone baseload power. And it's because you have other types of low-cost storage. You don't even need batteries, it turns out, for <coughs> stationary storage. You don't, I mean, you need them in cars, electric cars, but not for stationary storage. And so the types of storage we looked at that were low cost, well, there's heat for heating, there's like in water, in soil, in rocks, and basically in ice too for cooling. So, I mean, I'll give you an example. Well, then for electricity, the types of storage are existing, not growing, but existing hydroelectric power, pumped hydroelectric power, existing plus proposed pumped hydroelectric power, and concentrated solar power with the space change material. But it turned out we were able to stabilize the grid with just those types of storage without any stationary batteries. And to give you two examples of the storage, uh, there's a community in, in Canada called Drake Landing. It's in south of Calgary, about an hour. And for eight years, they've had in a suburban area, they have 52 homes that they have solar collectors on their roof, and they, in the summer, they collect sun into a glycol solution, and the glycol solution then gets passed to water into this kind of central building, and then the water is heated by the glycol solution, and then the water gets into, goes into boreholes underground, down to 30, 30 meters underground, and then it heats the ground up to 80 degrees Celsius. So, you know, well, it's actually rocks that are under the ground, and the rocks are insulated. And then that's stored, that heat is stored until wintertime, and then in the wintertime, when it's, there's snow all over the ground, it's run in reverse and heats 100% of the, the homes for all their purposes. Uh, so it provides, it's called seasonal heat storage, but it's a very low cost existing. And it's very, you don't even know it's there. I mean, I actually went there to visit. I couldn't even find it. It turned out it was like standing right on top of it. 
because there's, there's an oak park. There's an oak, right, there's a neighborhood park, and it was just a grassy field, and underneath the grass, underneath the field, there were rocks, there were hot rocks that were storing the heat. So that's one example um, of, of a simple type of storage that exists that's been around, and you can do this on a large scale at very low cost. Uh, second example is uh, until like a couple weeks ago, I've had uh, outside my building where I work, at Stanford University, there was a natural gas cogen plant that provided electricity and heat for, provided 80% of the uh, heat and electricity for the campus and providing 80% of the carbon emissions. Well, two weeks ago, the whole thing was bulldozed. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, the lights are still on. So <laughs> but it was just replaced with boilers and chillers and, and solar. And so, just heat exchanging. So they're just a, there's an elaborate pipe system around the university now, where there are two boilers and a chiller, and the, because parts of the campus need hot water and air, and parts need cold water and air at the same time. And it used to be that you used electricity or produce run uh, burn gas to produce the heat and use electricity for the cooling at the same time. Whereas you can really just exchange the heat around; it's a lot more efficient. So they have a very elaborate heat exchanging system and combined with just using solar for the electricity they need. And it eliminated immediately 80% of these carbon emissions from the university. And, but there's, you know, for, since 1998, before that, they actually had a, a big ice cube under a building, and the ice cube was frozen at night when, with, when the electricity prices were low, and then during the day, it would, uh, be, ice would be melted and provide this cooling for the university to reduce times of electricity demand, so that's, not a, that's a way of shifting loads, despite with ice cubes. Anyway, my, I want to just, I'm probably running out of time, so I just want to summarize what these plans are. So, the, so we've developed these plans for 139 countries in the 50 states to go to 100% renewable energy, and just, if I were to list, well, why do we want to do this, uh, you know, aside from eliminating global warming, and by the way, this would be a transition of 80% conversion by 2030 and 100% by 2050. And so we've actually done computer, because actually my main work, this is my night job, my main work <laughs> is, is computer modeling. I build climate models to simulate climate, air pollution, and weather. And I, the, you know, probably the biggest thing I've ever found was that black carbon was the second leading cause of global warming after carbon dioxide. So that was, so I looked a lot on the effects on particles on climate. And you know, one way to actually address global warming and climate change is to control selective pollutants, I mean, like black carbon, because it has, it's like a million times more powerful per unit mass than carbon dioxide, but there's a lot less of it in the atmosphere, and it's much shorter life than only a few weeks. Uh, but it is the second leading cause, it, like carbon dioxide causes about 42% of global warming, and black carbon is about 20%, and methane is about 15 to 16%, and then there's nitrous oxide and ozone and uh, chlorofluorocarbons. And, but, you know, because black carbon is a particle, and particles uh, kill worldwide from air pollution, kill four to seven million people worldwide each year, including about 60 to 65,000 in the United States, and it costs in the U.S. about 3% of the GDP for the mortalities and morbidities. So this is, on a worldwide scale, uh, it's estimated that, well, today it's about on the order of uh, 15 to 25 trillion dollars per year in health costs from the 4 to 7 million people plus the millions more that are built due to air pollution. And that's going to be equivalent in 2050. The climate impacts will also be around 20 trillion dollars per year. So there, there's a total of around 40 to 50 trillion dollars per year in health plus climate costs. But we'd eliminate those costs. But uh, well, my point about the black carbon was one way, the only way you can actually save the Arctic ice because is by eliminating black carbon emission. Because if we stop CO2 today, which we have to do, we stop catastrophic warming, still not going to save the ice. But black carbon, because of its short lifetime and its strong impacts on climate, uh, you can, and you also reduce health problems uh, simultaneously. So it's a double benefit. But that's so you can do that kind of accounting. But the key is you have to eliminate all combustion. So that means eliminating all sources of not only black carbon and carbon dioxide, but also there are also cooling particles, air pollution particles, that mask half of global warming that's occurring. So even though greenhouse gases plus black carbon cause this much warming, the net observed warming is this. 
And the difference is air pollution particles that cause cooling, such as sulfates and nitrates, they mask or offset half of global warming. And so if you actually just cleaned up air pollution particles, you'd actually see a rise in the observed warming, which is pretty scary. So you want to clean up the particles because they cause 90% of the health problems due to air pollution. But doing that will double global warming, actually, immediately. And this is a scary problem. So the, the only solution is to eliminate all the particles and the greenhouse gases simultaneously. And that's what our plans try to do. So they would eliminate four to seven million deaths per year immediately. And worldwide, well, immediately based on the time scale of, of the plans. And, <laughs> and, uh, and then CO2 and other greenhouse gases would go down as well. Now, we did, I did calculations that with an 80% conversion by 2030 and 100% by 2050, by 2100, we can get CO2 down to 370 parts per million, sorry, 350 parts per million by 2100 with 80% conversion by 2030 and 100% by 2050. But if you use any of the IPCC scenarios for the trajectories, any of them, the minimum you're going to get is, is 500 parts per million, and the maximum is like 8 to 900 parts per million. So the nice thing, good news is, is if we can aggressively eliminate 80% by 2030 and 100% by 2050, we can actually reduce CO2 to normal levels and slow down the um, warming. But just to summarize, you know, the last thing I'm saying, to summarize the benefits of all this, besides eliminating all these deaths, eliminating global warming as we know it, we stabilize energy prices because there's zero fuel cost to, to wind, water, and solar. Because solar doesn't cost anything, it doesn't cost anything. It's just, the, it's just the installation cost and operation and maintenance cost mm -hmm. over time. You not only stabilize energy prices, but the, then the actual the price over time it gets lower because you have to continuously mine and refine <coughs> fossil fuels and transport them so their prices go up over time whereas wind, water, solar, they stay relatively constant. But you also, each country will also produce its own energy. There are only a few countries like Singapore that might have to import some uh, energy because they're so small and have a huge population. But almost every country will be self-sufficient. That would eliminate you know, international or mostly reduce significantly international conflicts over uh, fuels, such as oil and gas, that currently occur, which could also eliminate terrorism risk. And the fact that you're also decentralizing a lot of power, because you have rooftop solar, wind is decentralized, that also reduces terrorism risk. So there's these multiple benefits. We would also found that worldwide we create 22 million jobs more than we lose, and in the US about 2 million jobs more than we lose. So there's a net jobs benefit, stabilizing prices, Secure, more secure future. So it sounds very rosy. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.